Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Rachel, a volunteer with Marine Conservation Network, where together we can make oceans of difference. Today, we are joined by Steve Allnett, the founder and managing director of Sussex Seabed Restoration Project. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, nice to be on here. So thank you for the invite. Well, we would love to get things started by having you dive into what exactly is the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project? Why did you start the organization and what are you guys accomplishing? Yeah, well, basically I started it because I've been swimming around the Sussex coastline for the last 29 years. And as you get older, you realize like, wow, you need to get on and do something about it. And there was nothing much going on really with conservation of kelp restoration. And in 2019, Sir David Attenborough narrated a video all about the Sussex coastline. And I got involved with that with the BBC. And I just thought, the, the lady that interviewed me at the end of it, she said, well, what are you going to do now to make it better? And I said, well, I don't know. And I kind of sat on it for a couple of weeks. And I thought, well, I'll best leave the NHS, which is the National Health Service. I'm a physio in the hospital. And I just thought to myself, I might as well um, see what I can do to progress this project going forwards. So were you always interested in kelp forest management even prior to that um, with with um, that interview that you had seen? Or, you know, has this been a lifelong thing that this yeah, is like, it's a bigger been, moment? It's, yeah, it's been a lifelong thing. Like When I was 12 years of age, she used to swim off the beach here and it used to be full of kelp. And it's been a massive de kelp decline. I mean, 97% of it's gone since 1988. So it's a massive amount of kelp gone over an area of, for, it's roughly about 300 square kilometres. So it's a massive amount of kelp gone. Um, I still monitor the kelp. I've been monitoring the kelp since the 1990s. Um, but I think it needs a bit of a push for kelp restoration for it to kind of come back. So what caused the degradation and damage? Can you expand on that? Yeah, it's probably like most things all around the world. Um, too much pressure on the seabed, too many different aspects of like dredging, trawling, um, too much of a demand on the seabed itself and not allowing nature to kind of restore itself. So it's probably just a massive amount of pressure and also like runoff from the rivers, uh, pesticides, pollution, sewage. Um, it's a combination of everything. So now is trawling and dredging still allowed in these waters? Uh, no, not in the inshore waters. So out to four kilometres where the old Sussex kelp beds used to be, um, there's a massive area now protected so nature can restore itself. And you can start seeing some of that um, natural rewilding of mussels and, you know, the Americans, like you guys, called it clams and that sort of stuff. But we we, uh, we have like whelks and different things like that. And, um, and you can start seeing the seabed restore itself but in terms of the flora and the flora there isn't much of that yet happening so I think a restoration project is needed to kind of give it that extra push. Well I know that there was a channel 4 video clip that you had posted talking about oh, yeah. this damage and the degradation um, and with that it sounds like there are also other types of seagrasses and vegetation that is starting to come up as well around these pockets of sea kelp but are these other seagrasses and vegetation an invasive species? Um, it, is there any vegetation that's coming back that's harmful or so far are you seeing very positive progress or you know, are there other harms that are still active? Yeah, like the seagrass, that's mainly like the river estuaries. Um, so that's not like directly in the sea because our sea here isn't suitable for it. It's too rough. So it will just pick up. So it's more like around the estuary trees of Sussex where you get seagrasses but yeah you've got invasive species um like sargasso um I don't know if you have sargasso out there but it's not a native uh, species it's a massive plant I mean it grows quite tall and it could block out light for other um delicate seaweeds underneath it to kind of get a foothold with the whole fast but um there is signs of kelp restoration coming back but it's mainly on the surface levels of the seabed, so higher up off the seabed, you can start seeing sporophytes um, on some rocks kind of gathering momentum, but it's a huge project and like all around the world um, with Kelp Alliance, uh, we need to kind of, and the Kelp Foundation, we need to start actually, you know, speeding this process up, up to restore the oceans. 
so the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project was founded in about two years now. Is that correct? Yeah, basically, I just thought, well, I was one night I was, I was trying to fall asleep, and I thought to myself, after another bit TV interview, I thought to myself, well, if I don't do anything, then what, what what's going to happen? Do you know what I mean? And then I kind of wish I did something. So I just got on with it and set up this government sort of charity. It's called a CIC, which is a community interest company. So, you know, and trying to gather momentum with it all to kind of make it work. And I'm growing loads of kelps at the moment, our native laminaries, um, hyperborea and sugar kelp. Um, and funny enough, I watched a lot of American stuff when I started doing kelp restoration because the, the Americans and the Canadians are so advanced with with actually cultivations of kelp. So I learned a lot from Vancouver and some parts of America just to kind of see how you guys grew it. Because, I mean, in England, we, we, we're we way behind all of that. So, um, yeah, so you're leading it. So well done. So you, well, thank you for the compliment. Are you... Um... <laughs> totally self-taught then with how to actually grow this and without giving any proprietary yeah. information I don't want to get too personal but um you know is this something that you started in your own backyard literally or like how do yeah, you yeah. go into this so basically I went on Instagram and started checking out kelp farms and uh kelp cultivation in Canada and America and I was just like oh hi like I'm really keen to grow kelp can you teach me how to do it and that's how it all started because in England there's nothing like this in along our coastline so I was kind of staying up quite late at night with the time difference to have meetings online with people teaching me how to get a good spore release when to start looking for the tissues um how to preserve the cultures, all that sort of stuff, all came from the, from America and Canada. So, yeah. And even my local university, I'm giving them the sporophytes because they don't grow them. So, Well, that's a very commendable effort on your part. That's a huge undertaking to really invest your time and energy into kind of being a founder of an entire process, it seems, for your area. Um, as far as the three specimens that you said that you've decided to grow, are they because those are what was native to the waters before trawling and dredging? Are any of them yeah, new and yeah. maybe they're just easier to grow? Can you just expand maybe on the purpose? Yeah, so, yeah. so basically what it was in the 1980s, like say, I don't know, four years ago, there was this really good report done on what native kelps there were on the different beaches along the Sussex coastline. It even gave the rust percentage like say so much percent of hyperborea so much percent of sugar kelp so much percentage of laminaries so I could kind of almost start piecing together the old historical history of data of the coastline so when Attenborough made his video I was thinking yeah that beach makes sense because that had that type of like covering of kelp on it so I was kind of like working it all out going back in time so when you start, hopefully, fingers crossed, doing the restoration project, you're laying it out like it used to be years and years and years ago. So, Well, that's pretty amazing that you're doing that. As far as getting to the actual areas where you're restoring, I mean, when we're talking about roughly 300 square kilometers, that's massive. Yeah. If I'm trying to do the math quickly in my head, I know that's over 100 square miles for the American audience. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you pinpoint what location to start in? How do you even get out there? Obviously, you must be a diver. Um, and well, I know you are because you show lots of great videos of your excursions underwater. But how do you pick an area and start there? Yeah, so basically, I'm working on the old mussel beds. The old mussel beds were key to kelp because the mussel beds were the filter feeders of the seabed. So where you've got good filter feeders, I'm kind of testing the grounds I was only me and a few other people. So obviously 300 square kilometers, there's no way we're going to be doing 300 square kilometers, but it's just patchwork of the old kelp beds that we're trying to recreate. And hopefully within time, if you create the old patchworks, maybe the kelps themselves will start spreading out over the next couple of decades. Now we've got a trawler ban in place. That's really nice to see that there is that trawling ban. I'm sure that gives the entire landscape an opportunity to actually yeah. take and restore itself thanks to your efforts here. Um, I, 
I, I want to say that there was also a ban though on any sort of vessel entering those waterways, including surfboards. Is oh, that no, true? it's, um, no, you can, you can, you can go on pleasure boat. You can go and jet skis, yachts, wherever it is. It's just the bottom trawling, the actual seabed itself. Like you just can't uh, touch it now. It's kind of now an air. Like obviously, like from fishing, professional fishing with trammel nets or gill nets, lobster pots, all of that can still carry on. It's just a very hard, you know, smashing up the seabed with trawler boats isn't allowed any longer so it's it's just it's more sort of um low impact fishing uh, um so anything that doesn't really destroy the seabed okay great so it sounds like it's not too challenging then for you to navigate from the shore to your actual target location you can yeah, get the really, boat and get yeah. out there okay yeah re really easy yeah so it's nice yeah well that's great um as far as the health and well-being of the plant landscape down there. I know that there are kelp forests under attack by sea urchins that eat away at the holdfasts that helps cure them to the seafloor. Yeah. Are there any issues like that around you? Anything that makes you anxious about whether or not the um, certain areas are more susceptible to those kinds of no, things? No, not at all really. Like, I've been to Monterey Bay in California and, and I know like near Santa Cruz and that you've got like those little sea urchins are everywhere, aren't they? And um, munching away on the kelps. Um, but in England, we don't really have... We've got sea urchins, but they're not anything in, like invasive as they are on the on the coast of America where, you know, you've got your giant kelps and all the rest of it and, and they get munched away by the your sea urchins. So, it's yeah, it's different, different sort of terrain. Um, and also, it's very shallow, the water here, like where it's in California. Um your drop off. I remember going out whale watching and how quickly the beach uh, shelves off over that way. So the kelp beds off the Sussex coastline go out to four kilometers, um, and the water depth is so shallow. Whereas, like, say, if I, if you spoke about California, like it is it, so much deeper, just literally just shelves off the beach, doesn't it? That's why you've got such good surf over there. So, well, that's that's great then that the issues are not quite the same for you, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are maybe these larger looming predators such as climate change and ocean warming and acidification yeah. curious if you have any thoughts on that does that play a part in the destruction of kelp beds is that a factor that you're considering as well i'll watch the temperatures of the seabed um go up and down each year uh, we've got monitoring boys out here you can get an app and you can check what the temperatures are like in the thermocline um uh, in terms of like those sorts of temperatures they were pretty much bang on like literally like there's no changes in that so it can't really be about the temperature warming for kelp because the kelp off the coastline here is so hardy it can cope with the really cold weather in the winter time when it goes down to like minus six and it last year we got to 40 degrees on land it was the first time in england uh, the temperature raised to 40 degrees. I don't know what that is in American Fahrenheit, but... Um, Over 100 degrees, it's these hot. Kelp, yeah, but these kelps, they even dry out at low tide off the reefs off the coastline here, and they still can survive the really cold and the real hot. So they are kind of almost like a pedigree sort of kelp. It's used to this terrain. So it's just, you know, so they're kind of hanging in there. So... There's, you know, hopefully we can develop that and and do more kelp restoration to restore the areas. Because at the moment, if you've got a barren seabed, like all around the world, because we've trawled up and damaged it, with, with you know, the sun is kind of bouncing back off the seabed. Nothing's been absorbed. So we need these vital seaweeds and kelps back. There is another looming dread that I have to ask about as well, which is pollution. Um, you know, the top yeah, of in the bottom of the Mariana Trench has discovered pollution, including plastic bottles. Is that anything that you're seeing when you're out and about? Is that an issue whatsoever that maybe it's worth bringing people's attention to as well? Yeah, well, our, our plumbing, well, sorry, our sewage system goes back to the Victorian days. So nothing's been updated since Queen Victoria was on the throne. Um, so you're going back like way before the queen and all the rest of it. So the previous queen. So um, yeah, so we're really out of date. We, we need to actually deal with 
how many more people live in the UK and how to deal with the toxins going into the water to try and purify the sea. Um, we're not polluting instead. So, yeah, that's a big, big, big task, that one. Yeah. Well, with what you have seen and the progress that you have made over these past couple of years and your efforts specifically with the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project, are you able to have any sort of forecast or prediction on when might we actually see healthy, rejuvenated and revived kelp forests? Is that something that you can even guesstimate right now? No, not at all. I, I've only just started getting into this. So I, I monitor yeah. the kelp beds um, and see how the, which way the spores are kind of going. So what's kind of being restored on the on the next beaches along, along the coastline. Um, and I'm growing loads of plants uh, here, like literally just about 20 foot away from where I'm sitting right now. Um, and I'm just trying trial and error, really, just putting them in different terrains along the sea coast or along the coastline just to see which ones take the best, which ones might not work, higher or lower in the water, so to see if there's too much sediment on the seabed or too much pollution. So I'm just trying to figure out where you can start pinpointing the optimum amount of growth of, of different species of kelps and seeing what those results might be like. So I'm basically it's like data collecting. You're just going out there trying to data collect and seeing what, what which ones work in the best locations. Absolutely. Well, that's great. It, you said earlier that you're partnering with some other organizations as well to help with your efforts. Uh, yeah. You yourself, kind of a one-man show with your organization, have you yourself expanded? Um, what kind of village is it looking like right now? <laughs> um, I don't know, really. Like, um, I've got a bit of interest. Like, nothing set in stone just yet. Um and I did a crowdfunder. It's called it's called the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project that went in the national newspaper, and loads of people donated towards it. Um, you know, all the time I say I was, you know, people get in contact saying I'd love to help out, but at the moment I've not actually got any real like, you know, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it, sort of thing. So we're kind of building up to it, or I am, but um, it hasn't kind of quite happened yet. So is funding the most critical need you have? And is that crowdfunding uh, website the best platform to support you through that? Yeah, that's the best. That's the best one because they can read all about the project. They can see the, the video on uh, YouTube. Um, you know, even if you type in Sir David Attenborough, Sussex Kelp, you, you can kind of get the history of what the past was like and, and our unique species in the sea, on the seabed of Sussex Coast. So altogether, you can see that somebody's trying to do something about it. And it's not just a kind of chit chat. It's actually kind of everything I do is um, you can actually see the process and I film it on the GoPro and, you know, just to try and make it as evidence based a hundred percent as possible. So, you know, people can get the vibe of all of it. That's so great that you are really effective at taking these videos to show the progress. You're very proactive about communicating to the public about what things are looking like and the progress that you've made um, and how people can get involved. I'll let you finish up here by asking you a question of just if there's anything remaining that we haven't said yet that you'd like to. And while I give you a chance to think about that, I'll share with our listeners that they can find the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project online through Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And of course, as we mentioned, there's the crowdfunding page. So if they just Google the organization name, they'll be able to find that. So if there's any other yeah, locations we can find you, let me know. Um, and with that, do you have any final thoughts that you would love to share with our listeners too about your efforts? No, not at all. Just say thank you very much for listening in. And uh, it's really nice to collaborate with you. Well, we do really appreciate that you took the time to explain more to an audience of interested um, individuals how they can help you, what you're doing, what to be on the lookout for, just learning more about kelp forest management as well is fascinating. You are definitely someone who is making oceans of difference. So that's a value to us as well. So with that, again, thank you, Steve, for your time today.